what we were looking at is a system where we were converting species A to species B. There happened to be isomers of each other in this situation. And the forward reaction is given by K1, reverse reaction by K1. When we deal with multiple reactions, and when we deal with reversing the reactions, we need to write out our rate expressions for every single reaction that occurs. And with reversible reactions, we recognize that that can be written as simply two reactions. In this case, A goes to B and B goes to A with the rate constants. We spent our uh, last class looking at the derivation of that rate constant dependent on temperature. There's an equilibrium constant, which is also a function of temperature. And then the reverse reaction is defined as K1 over the, the equilibrium constant of this. So where we, were, where we ended off last time was looking at the next step, which is getting the temperature dependence through the reactor. So as we go through the reactor from inlet to outlet, so it's taking place in the front of the reactor, my temperature here at the inlet and then at the outlet, we put a model for this given by dx dv. So my volume volume of the is the volume of the reactors that go from left to right, and I've got the conversion from left to right. But I also know that as material gets converted, it's releasing heat. As heat's released, the temperature is increasing. So there's also a temperature profile along here. So the temperature will go up, and we're not sure what's going to happen with it. So what, essentially what we're looking for is the temperature as a function of conversion. So that's what the adiabatic reaction, sorry, the adiabatic equation is that you have in front of you. If you go to the handout from last night, we've got temperature then expressed as a function of the thin messy equation on the right hand side. That's what we're going to investigate and where we ended off last night, in fact, investigating. We're going to finish up with that. So if you flip over to page two, we started by looking at a few entries in that equation to help simplify things for us. So we have the Einstein's derivation delta CP we derive as zero. We call that the change in heat capacity. We also derive Theta A is equal to Guys, just to say, this is really important, this example. Okay? This example has a lot of features and characteristics for the course of the question. Just pay real attention here. This is like four or five days before it's due. So, theta A is the ratio of the flows for species A. Theta B is the ratio of the flows for species B. Here, F B naught over F A naught, that's zero because we're not feeding any B into the reactor. Then theta I is the molar flow ratio of the inverts relative to F A naught. If you show last part of E to 0.9. So that's that's where we ended off with the class last night. The next steps then on the second page of the handout are to derive that summation term. So we've got the sum of theta i and CPI times T mole. And we, we started subbing in the values for that last night. We can show that it's T mole. I'll take T mole out because that's common. And then just sum over the remaining i species. Theta i, well, it's two species A. Theta A is 1. So then we're just reduced to CPA. Theta B is zero, so we don't have to account for B. And then theta for the inert species is 0.1 over 0.9 multiplied by CPR. And then the T naught outside the brackets. So if I sum in the values for that, I'll leave T naught here for now and see why. So that gets me to T naught 141 plus 0.1 over 0.9 times 161. And that simplifies then down to 159 T. The units for this term 
are the same units as the heat capacity multiplied by temperature. So joules per mole Kelvin times Kelvin distance in joules per mole. The other term we have is very, very similar. It's the, the summation of theta i to CPI. So there's no T naught over here. And that's why I, I did this first example, just leaving T naught as a constant. So that allows us to simply write that this is immediately equal to 159. But this time the units are different. It's joules per mole Kelvin. Then the final term that we need in that expression on page 2, in the middle of the page, is the heat of reaction at the reference temperature. Let's note then that it's given as minus delta HR at the reference temperature. So that's minus, minus 6,900 joules per mole. So that gets me 6,900. So the acid reaction always that per mole is for relative to a particular species in this case is my basis A. So the heat of reaction is 6,900 joules per mole per reaction. So now I'm ready to sub into that equation midway down to page 2. And we get, we get it simplifying for us. Show that T is equal to X times 6,100 plus 159 times T0 divided by 159. Or in other words, we get temperature is equal to 43.3 times the conversion plus T0. So this gets me exactly what I was looking for earlier. I needed two equations to simulate the system. I needed the x by dv, my differential equation for the process. That's equal to minus Ra over Fa. So I've got minus Ra, we derived that last night. But then the second piece that I need is temperature as a function of conversion. And despite the fact that that equation halfway down page 2 looks extremely messy, it simplifies down to something straightforward over here. Temperature is 43 times the conversion plus T0. And it simplifies quite nicely in this case because of the number of these terms used in the expression of zeros. So, our aim with this example was, in the question, it, it asks to find what the conversion is after a certain volume. So for a given volume of reactor, find the conversion. <coughs> so let's take a, take a note of it, because what we're going to do then is start to investigate how that conversion changes when we change temperature, which is, um, which is an important aspect of this problem. So, Let's take a look then. We're going to see for a particular volume of reactor, I was going to use a volume of 5 meters cubed. What is the conversion? So, in the second handout, or I should say tonight's handout that you have in front of you, it looks just like, a, well, it is just a whole bunch of math that code. Okay, so if everyone has that hand up, the reason why I, I, I gave it to you is so that you can see the equations we derived last night in coded form. But there's also an interesting aspect to this MATLAB code. The MATLAB code here is going to show you how to make the model function a little bit more flexible to help you simulate the reactor many, many times over so that you can call it iteratively. Okay, so that's one problem with polymath, is polymath, you have to click and it only runs once. MATLAB, though, we can write scripts that calls the function and integrates it many hundreds of times for us, which we're going to need to do for this course project. And there's a special way of doing that, which is here in the code. For this. So this is why, why I printed it out of here. It's also available for you on the course website. 
So the code up here starts by simply specifying all the problems constants that were given in the original uh, question. It then goes and gives me the equation for temperature T is 43.3 multiplied by conversion plus T0. It gives my heat, uh, so my temperature dependence for the rate constant K1, temperature dependence for Kc, I've got the definition for K1R. We also have the definition for CA and CB in terms of the usual stoichiometric expression. So CA is CA naught plus multiplied by 1 minus the conversion, and CB is CA naught multiplied by theta B, which is 0 in this case, plus conversion. Okay. So those are, those are <coughs> last night. And then the final endpoint to this model is simply the ODE, which is dx by dv, dependent variable as a function of the independent variable is minus ra over fa naught. So that's the last line just in the, in the question. Oh, where is that? Where is that? Is that that's exactly what we're going to talk about now. Yeah, that's, that's, this, that's the emphasis of why I've printed this code out for you. So for now, let's just know that t naught is going to be there. I'll show you what that's doing in a minute. So then we go to our, our regular driver. The driver is the part of the MATLAB code that actually does the integration for us. So that's on the, on the bottom half of page three. We specify the start and end point for my um, volume. So here I'm going to integrate from zero meters cubed to five meters cubed. My independent variable is conversion. It's zero at the start of the reactor. And here's where I specify T naught. So T naught is the entry temperature, 330 Kelvin. We're used to specifying T naught in the model part of the code, right? So in the top half of this handout, we usually have T naught there as one of my constants. What I've done here is I pulled T naught out of that function and put it here into the outer function. And the reason for that is we're going to call that inner function, the, the plug flow reactor, so PFR code, the part, the part of the code that's on the top of the page, we're going to call that many, many times with different T naught values. And because I'm going to do that in an automatic way, I want to tell this function what T naught is and send it in as a new variable. So that's what this code is doing. It says specify T naught out here as param of T naught, then call ODE45, integrating this PFR example function. Give it my initial conditions for the independent variable, the final condition for the independent variable, and then the initial conditions for the dependent variable. So that's all, all that you're used to seeing. Then there's two new inputs over here that we haven't seen before. The first, or the, or the, so this is input one, input two, and this third input is a function called optum set, just open and close brackets. All that does is it finds the default settings for the ODE integrator, and it just sends that in to the function. So that you can just copy and paste. The final input is this param structure. So the param is going to be a structure that contains various sub-components. In this case, it only contains one, T0. So that's how we send this value of T0 into the function that we're going to integrate. So let me demonstrate that for you by run the code up to that point param.t0, param is a structure in MATLAB, t0 is a, a sub-entry of that, and it's going to go into, into uh, the ODE function. So for those of you that are familiar with Python, param here is a structure variable in MATLAB, it's the equivalent of what you would call a Python dictionary. So if you cover dictionaries in your first year course in coding, that's, um, that's exactly what it is here. It's just a MATLAB equivalent. So now if I go to my param, uh, sorry, my, my integration, take a look here. We're used to seeing only two variables coming in, my independent variable and my dependent variable. Now I've got a third one, param. Param then is that same structure, and when the ODE integrator gets to this point, param.t0 is available to me, and I can use it inside this function. So what, what I've done is, Previously, you would have hard coded T naught here equals 330. Okay. Now I 
I don't have that anymore. I have T0 being specified outside this <coughs> and it's going to get inside here through this parameter. <coughs> okay, so other than that, the code is, is identical to MATLAB codes that you've used so far in this course. Let's, let's run this code then and spend more time investigating the output than the actual MATLAB code. So here's, here's what we get. Here are our reactor profiles. And this is what we're more interested in interpreting. So let's take a look at these for a minute. The first profile we get is the conversion profile. The conversion from the beginning of the reactor starts at zero, ramps up, and reaches a final conversion of about 70 over a The temperature profile is also available. I can, once I've got conversion x, I can go calculate the temperature profile using this equation here, T. So conversion multiplied by 43.3 plus T naught gets me my T. So that's why this function over here looks identical to this one on the left, on the right. So that's the temperature in my reactor. It starts off at 330 and it ramps up by about 30 degrees from beginning of the reactor to the end of the reactor. The next variable that I, I get out is the concentration. Concentration starts off at the amount specified, I think it was around 9,300, and this is concentration of A, so A is reacting away, so the concentration increases as we progress through the flow flow reactor and steadies out at some final value. What's more interesting here is the rate. So this is the rate shown over here. In fact, it's not quite accurate to say that that's the rate. It is, in fact, minus RA over FA naught. But FA0 is a constant, so it's really essentially what I'm plotting as a scale version of the rate. The rate shows me probably what you would expect intuitively to happen in this reactor. We start off at the beginning of the reaction of the reactor, and A starts to react. A reacts and goes to B, and because this is an exothermic reaction, it's releasing heat. So we see that's why the temperature is going up. As the heat is being released, K1, the forward rate constant, is increasing. So that's react, that K1 term is going up. And remember that the rate RA is equal to K1 CA, that's the forward rate, minus K1 reverse CB. So as K1 is going up and CA is going down, K1 is going up a little faster than C1 and CA is going down. So my overall rate is at least ramping up. As the temperature gets higher and higher, the temperature is going up, K1 is going up, that means my rate is going up. But it gets to a point where rate starts to drop off. What's happening here is that A is starting to be depleted. My raw material, my reactant A is disappearing. So then rate starts to drop off. In addition to that, as you go to higher temperatures, my equilibrium constant, Kc, we showed for exothermic reactions, Kc will get smaller and smaller. So last, or a few classes ago, we showed Kc is the equilibrium concentration of B over the equilibrium concentration of A. And we also showed that this function of Kc with respect to temperature the exothermic reactions look something like that. So the temperature goes higher, Kc drops. And as Kc is dropping, that implies I'm, my, my reaction is running in the backwards direction. Okay, so what we end up getting is that this curve is showing a balance of what's happening in the forward direction and in the reverse direction. My reaction is getting faster and faster, but it gets to a point where it gets diminishing returns and I've got less and less A to react, and so I end up reaching this point where RA tends to zero. Okay, so RA, the rate of reaction here, is getting to zero. That's pretty insightful. In this particular instance, the fact that the rate gets to zero indicates that I'm reaching equilibrium by the end of the reactor. And that's, that's Pretty interesting because for many systems we do not actually ever achieve equilibrium. From the beginning of the reactor to the end of the reactor, we may never reach equilibrium in many instances. In this case, we know we're reaching equilibrium because the rate of reaction 
take this down and steady it out to zero. If I integrate this beyond five meters cubed, so here I'm integrating to five meters cubed. If I went to 10 meters cubed and ran that, the plots would look no different after the fifth, fifth meter in the reactor. So here, sorry, I've got kilograms, this should be meters cubed. But pretty much my rate, once I'm reaching equilibrium, I remain at that point for the rest of the reaction. Okay, so the temperature, everything is pretty much steady from about five meters on this, five meters cubed on this. Okay, so this is then just an implementation of the example we looked at last night and helps us answer this question, what is the conversion? Well, we can go look at, at what that is numerically in the software. In the software, I, it's this uh, x variable and my, my, my dependent variable. And so I can just go list what that dependent variable is in MATLAB and it's pretty much, so we see that at the beginning of the reaction is zero conversion towards the end of the reactor, we steady out and land up at 71.4% conversion. So let's just take a note of that. So we're going to get for temperature, our inlet temperature was here, T0 was 330 Kelvin, I get a conversion of 71.4%. Conversion in T0. What's going to happen to my conversion as the temperature, my inlet temperature increases? You cannot tell which way you're going to go. Okay, because there's competing things occurring here. So what we do is we create a table then that's, that shows us how conversion will change. So let's take a look then, if we go from 330, let's go down to the case of about 305 Kelvin. We run that code. And what I'm going to do is let's move this over here. Let's, so we're going to run that code, and what you see down here printed there at the last entry, that's the final conversion leaving the reactor, so 58.7%. So at 305 Kelvin, we're at 58.7. We can go up a bit, um, let's go up to 310. So we run that. And it's, then we end up with a conversion of 72.5. 310, we get 72.5%. We can try 315. And we get a little bit higher, 73.3%. Kelvin, we get 72.6. Now we're starting to fall off again. two variables though, so you would then, here I could easily visualize this single variable case where I'm 
trying to judge what conversion looks like based on inlet temperature. So I can vary my inlet temperature and plot conversion at the exit. And it's going to do something that rises sharply and it falls off like that. If you've got two variables, you now have to plot conversion at the exit relative to T0 and P0, you should visualize that probably as a grid or a mesh. Okay, so one, one way you might do that is, in MATLAB, you use the mesh function to get something along the lines of something like that. <coughs> So the mesh function, I don't know if there's something wrong with that's kind of old. So the mesh function, you can then visualize what the profile looks like for temperature on one axis and pressure on another axis. You can find the optimal conditions then that get you the highest, in this case, I was looking at yields. So this MATLAB code that you have in front of you then is, is pretty important. Make sure you go through it and understand how to use it, and how, how you can use it to bring in a new variable, T0 and P0, and use that inside the simulation. So rather than hard coding it into the simulation and then having to change it manually, this allows you to write a little function that you can call your integrator multiple times and then generate these plots pretty painlessly. If you're using polymath for this, uh, you're doing it wrong and it's going to be tedious. Well, not you're doing it wrong, it's just you're going to be causing more problems. That's good. Okay. So that's, a, that's an example then of, of the material we considered last night. I just want to make a few notes here on this idea of optimum temperatures. my equilibrium constant drops off, but I have very fast forward and reverse reactions. That implies that I approach equilibrium very rapidly, but I get I will end up with low conversion and low yields. So approach equilibrium rapidly. Okay, that's what the first part tells me. The fact that I have very fast forward and reverse reactions at high temperature means I will, will likely achieve equilibrium, but I'm going to be at low conversion and low yield. So low conversion and low yield. Far more products 
But the problem is if I've got a very slow forward and reverse reaction, I may never actually reach that equilibrium. So the, up, the conclusion from that is I may never actually reach that. Because the, my reaction rates are so slow. So I'll get very low conversions. So both situations, both high temperatures over there on this board and low temperatures over there on the other board, both instances, very different mechanisms taking place, but both land up with low conversion and low yield. Okay, so there's definitely a middle ground in between an extremely low temperature where you get very sluggish, almost no reaction occurring. You can show that if I drop this temperature down just a little bit more, my reaction barely even proceeds. Basically, I'm sending my feed into my reactor and it's coming back out again on the other side. So the reaction is so slow because of the low reaction rates. Even though the equilibrium constant might be high, I'll never actually reach equilibrium. I'll need a, a pretty long reactor to get to equilibrium. So that's no good. The opposite extreme is also no good. The opposite extreme is I'm going so rapidly, I'm going to approach equilibrium, but because that equilibrium constant is low, means I'm creating more raw material than I'm creating product. The reverse reaction is going, is being favored over the forward reaction. So I never actually get my products forming to the extent that I would like. Okay, so definitely a middle ground. And then what we showed now was a way to find that optimum temperature. Let's take a look now at how we should proceed for reactions where we've got heat being removed from the reactor or heat being added to the reactor. So one thing we know from exothermic reactions is that, as we just saw, saw here, as heat is being released, it, in, it inhibits the reaction or it, it changes the equilibrium constant. So what we often do for exothermic reactions is we aim to remove that heat from the system. By removing heat from the system, I lower the temperature and I drive the equilibrium forward and I increase my yield. But up to now we've assumed that Q is zero. So for the adiabatic case, I've assumed Q is equal to zero. Well, let's take away that assumption and, and derive what will happen in the reactor if we have heat being transferred in and out. So if we take a plug flow reactor, I have material entering at FA naught, T naught, and then I have material leaving at FA with a certain temperature T. What I'm going to do is just consider a small slice of the reactor with, with delta L and volume is equal to <coughs> And what we can do is we can do a heat balance the same way as we looked at the heat balance uh, two nights ago at the start of this week. We can do a heat balance, but now we're just doing it over a small region. We say delta Q dot is the heat entering and leaving. I'll define that in a minute. Plus the Enthalpy entering, so Fi, Hi, this is at point B, minus the enthalpy leaving. amount of heat added and removed into that slice. So that's delta Q dot. <coughs> I 
and it's given as the heat transfer coefficient for the tubular reactor multiplied by a new variable I'll define or call lowercase a. I'll define it in a minute. Multiplied by delta v ta minus t. So ta then is the ambient temperature. is the temperature in that slice. Let's just take a look at, uh, at that, those two terms. The product of those two terms is the area for heat transfer. So U is my heat transfer coefficient. A multiplied by delta V is my area through which that heat is being transferred. So it's the internal surface area in this slice. So the area that that tube is exposed to all the way around on the circumference. And we could write this as A is equal to that tubular area divided by delta V. A, that tubular area is then pi. Pi D is the perimeter of the tube multiplied by delta L. So pi D then, this portion here. perimeter of the outer perimeter of the tube. Delta L is equal to the length of that sliver we're considering. Divided by delta V, which is pi D squared over 4, multiplied by delta L. So that simplifies quite nicely to 4 over D. So we, we call A then, if you want to express that in, in more easier to use terms, it's the heat exchange area available per unit volume of reactor. Okay, so A has units then we just do a dimensional analysis here. U has units of watts per meter squared Kelvin. A has units. I prefer you to write it out as meter squared per meter cubed. <coughs> Don't simplify it to inverse meters. Just, just leave it as meter squared per meter cubed to emphasize that it's an area per unit volume. So we're multiplying watts per meter squared Kelvin with this unit over here and multiply by temperature and we'll get the delta, delta Q. of those entropy terms in the heat expression. So substitute entropy terms. So I'll say uh, C plus 10A. So tonight is class 10C. So two nights uh, or on Monday nights class 10A, we looked at those entropy terms. So we substitute those in for H. So we, we 
showed that those HI terms can be re-expressed in terms of heat capacities, they can be re-expressed in terms of heat of reaction. So I'll make note of that. those substitutions, which leads to something that's pretty messy. We also then take limits as delta V tends to zero. And then we get a pretty useful equation that we're going to, that's going to give us the temperature profile in the reactor as we go from beginning to end. We get probably one of the very <coughs> important reactions by the equations that we're going to use in T by dV, the rate of change of temperature as we can go from entry to exit of the reactor is equal to minus Ra <coughs> minus the heat of reaction. minus U times A, the temperature minus the ambient temperature. Divided by the flow, multiplied by the flow. seconds to get that down and we'll then investigate what that equation means. We'll explore some of the interpretations. On, on the one that I had up on the board just before the exit. In the slide. In the slides. So let's just uh, make a few, a few important notes here. So this tells us the temperature profile. tells us the temperature profile. So if dt by dv is positive, it means that my temperature is increasing as I go from entry to exit in the reactor. So let's just emphasize that if dt by dv is greater than zero, then temperature rises. important insight because we're going to look at how we can make that profile positive or negative. Let's take a look. U over here is a positive quantity. My heat transfer coefficient is a positive quantity. A is a positive quantity. It's an area per meters cubed. Denominator flows are positive quantities and CP heat capacity for positive quantities. So the only or well, one way we can make dt by dv go higher and higher is if this minus Ra times minus HR term, that term which we can interpret as equal to heat generated. So let's, let's call that term, not, not F, let's just call it that, define it as minus Ra multiplied by delta HR. That's the amount of heat generated. So Ra is the rate of, at which we're, we're consuming a species A, multiplied by the heat of reaction released for every mole that's reacted. 
this term tells me how much heat is generated by, by the reaction. The term UA, U times A, times T minus TA is telling me how fast I'm removing heat from the system. tells how fast heat is removed. Okay. And let's be clear here, heat is only removed reactor if the temperature inside the reactor exceeds the ambient temperature. So the, the direction of heat transfer is always important as you know. So T is the temperature inside the reactor, T ambient is what's outside. So heat is only removed from the system if that ambient temperature is lower. Or in other words, if the, in the inside temperature inside the reactor exceeds the ambient temperature, then heat is going to be removed. Heat is added in the converse case. So if I was running an endothermic reaction, I would want my ambient temperature to be greater than the internal temperature. So heat gets added to the system. Heat is added if Ca exceeds T. Okay, this always trips people up. People always get confused on this because what is the sign of heat of reaction for exothermic reactions? Negative. Okay, so delta HR is negative for an exothermic reaction. Multiplied by a negative gives me a positive. What sign does minus RA have? Always positive. So positive, positive, I'm going to get heat released. Heat C by dP is going to go up as long as this term is then heat being generated by the system, so it's releasing heat into the system. So people often get their signs mixed up and get confused with that negative on the heat of reaction. So, so be clear, uh, let's actually <coughs> emphasize that then up with a, an additional note, yeah, that delta HR is negative for exothermic. Guaranteed, some of you are going to see your reactor profiles decrease in temperature and you're not going to understand why. And it's all, almost always because of the sign issue. Now, so this is all good and well. What we've derived up here, but it's, it's suitable for plug flow reactors, but not packed bed reactors. So let's just take a look at one way we can convert this expression here over to a packed bed reactor where we integrate with respect to W. So it's a very simple change. All we all we substitute in to recognize is that dW is equal to rho B times dB. So rho B there. Let's define that quite clearly. Um, this is the bulk density of the catalyst. And it has units of kilograms of catalyst per meter cubed of occupied reactor volume. So meter cubed of occupied reactor volume. Maybe one, one way to help understand that, because there's the definition for the bulk density and there's the definition for rho c, the actual catalyst density. So one way is just to, to draw a picture of that, just to make sure that you're, you're clearly getting the distinction correct. Many people uh, got this wrong on the midterm, so this is an issue. 
if we take my reactor and assume it's filled with catalyst, remember we defined um, phi as the voidage. So rho c would be the density of that element over there. So it's the density of the particular catalyst particle. <coughs> rho b, on the other hand, is the bulk density, is the density throughout the reactor, considering the entire amount of occupied volume. So it's the, the kilograms, the weight of catalyst you have in there, divided by the meters cubed of occupied reactor volume. So rho b then is my volume. Okay, recall that that's equal to 1 minus phi times rho c. So we always have rho b smaller than rho c. So this is called packed bed reactor. So we derive the original expression for plug flow reactor. So that's dt by dv. I'm just showing you, we can sub in this expression over here, and basically what it ends up with is that if I wanted to express this as dt by the w, I divide through my rho v over here. So we'll, I'll recap this point in the class uh, next week. This equation that's up here is the one that you use for your project. Okay. So in the tutorial on Monday and Tuesday, for those of you coming to that, we'll, we'll work with that and start to substitute that into the whole.